Good morning, church. Good morning. And welcome. Welcome to our Sunday morning. It's so good to be with you all again, isn't it, Molly? Yeah. Now, this is probably Molly's last time of doing this, uh, doing Until the welcome. Until Easter. Until Easter. Why is that? Until Easter holidays. Because where are you going back on Monday? I'm going back to school. Yay, Molly's going back to school. We've had our last day of homeschooling today, haven't we? All done. Mum is finished being the teacher now, which is great. Mm. Right, let's get on with our service, shall we? It's so good to be together again today. I really hope and pray that you've all had a blessed week and that you are ready to hear what God wants to share with us all today as a church. We have got the very wonderful, can you remember who's preaching today? Andy. Andy. Andy Mason. Andy Mason. He's a dear, dear friend of ours and I know obviously lots of you now know him as well because he's preached at church a couple of times and he preached a few weeks ago and that was such a good word for us as a church. We've asked him to share his heart again with us a bit later this morning so that's great and something to really look forward to. Now just before we were about to start recording this we noticed that Molly had something on her t-shirt written on her t-shirt which is actually quite apt. Lift your stand up a bit and see if people can see what it says. Fearless. That's what it says, doesn't it? Now then, do you know what being fearless means? You're not afraid. You're not afraid. That's exactly right. Not afraid. And that's what God wants us to be, isn't it? Fearless and not afraid. So we thought it might be great to start with. Molly wants to read something from her new Bible again today. And so she is going to read Deuteronomy 31, chapter 31. And it's just one verse, isn't it? It's verse eight. So have a listen to what this wonderful little verse says. The Lord himself will lead you and be with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. So do not lose courage or be afraid. Wow, there we go. And why aren't we to be afraid? Because the Bible says don't be afraid. It does. And apparently it says fear not or do not be afraid 365 times I've heard. I think Daddy said that. Now that means that there's do not be afraid or fear not one for every day of the year, 365. So that's, God, that's, a, that's every day of the year. Every day of the year. So every day of the year, God tells us not to be afraid. How wonderful is that? That's a lot of times. And we don't need to be afraid because God's in control. Isn't he? Yeah. How wonderful. <laughs> so let's start our morning by praying together. Let's close our eyes. Yeah, Lord Jesus, what a joy it is to come together in your name today. Father God, we just bring our praise, our worship, our thanks to you this morning. You are such a good God, Lord, and we, we love you. We love being in your presence. Lord, and we ask, Father, that you would speak to us today, individually, into our own hearts, but also corporately as a church, when Andy shares your heart with us today. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful scripture that Molly's just read, that we don't need to be afraid because you are with us. You go before us, Lord, and we can trust fully in your word. We can trust fully in your name. We can trust fully in your promises. And today we choose to not be afraid, but to trust, Lord God, in you. Father, thank you for this week. Thank you for the sunshine that we've had. Thank you for your blessings, your grace and your mercy. Lord, we remember those who are unwell. We remember those who are grieving, those who have had a tough week. May they take that scripture on board this morning to fear not and to trust in you. Because, Lord God, you go before us. You always make a way and you are such a good God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to save us. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you lead us and guide us. Father, we commit this morning to you. Have your way now in us and through us. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. 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 Oh, I just thought of something. Didn't you want to play a game quickly? <laughs> Molly's asked that we play a game and it is spot the difference. Now, not with anything around us, because actually there is a difference. There's some flowers, which I expect people have spotted, but it's to do with Molly. So Molly wants you to spot the difference. People might have already spotted it. They might have already spotted it, but let's just give them another 10 seconds to see if they can notice anything different with Molly this week, as opposed to when she did this welcome with daddy a couple of weeks ago. Okay, go on then. I saw it straight away that time. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Spot the difference! If my teeth fell out. <laughs> Molly's tooth fell out a couple of weeks. Uh, when was it last week, maybe? Uh, it was a Tuesday night. Oh, it was a Tuesday night. There we go. <laughs> so Molly's lost her tooth, haven't you? Yay! Did you say? There we go. Right, let's go on to some notices of what we've got coming up this week for you. Um, coffee shop is still shut, obviously. Um, I'm sure you're aware of where we're at as a church. We have made the decision as leaders to reopen on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, the 4th of April, which is so exciting for us. We can't wait, the can we? The day after your birthday. Oh. It is the day after my birthday. My birthday is Easter Saturday, isn't it, this year? Hmm, there we go. Um, I didn't tell her to plug that, by the way. <laughs> so we are going to do an outdoor service like we did um, at Christmas time. That just worked so well and it gives us the opportunity to sing as well, which is really great. So we're going to be meeting at the front of church by the green there on the Resurrection Sunday, that's the 4th of April, and that will be at 11 o'clock. Now we will send you lots more details a bit nearer the time, won't we, of logistics and how that will all work. And then all going well, we will then meet every Sunday after that, which is wonderful, and the Wednesday nights, our teaching night, and Friday night prayer as well. We are hoping we'll be back in the church building. Again, we'll give you much more details about that nearer the time. For this week, though, Wednesday night, we've got uh, the wonderful Tim preaching, which will be great. Half past seven, we will send the link out for that. And then the same again, Friday night, we've got our Zoom prayer meeting. Please join us if you, if you haven't done it before and you want to. Give us a call and we can explain how to set that up and be part of the prayer night. It's wonderful because we break bread together and just have a really intimate time together. So that will be great. Also, just a reminder that our newsletter that we always used to hand out at church on a Sunday, that's on our website. And I, like Mark, want to just really encourage you to read it. It keeps you updated with everything. It gives you notices. There's a God's grace for the journey where someone shares a testimony of what God's done in their life, whether it be recent or years ago. And if you have, a testimony yourself, maybe from the last year of what God's done for you um, or within you, then please let Mark or I know and um, perhaps you could have a go at writing one because um, it's great to hear people's testimony. It's a wonderful way to encourage people. Uh, so that's the newsletter that's available on the website. If you struggle to get on the website, then we could always send you one in the post. Again, give me a call and we can arrange that with you. So I think that's our notices. Um, we have our birthdays coming up in a minute. Oh, actually, before we do, let me just explain a bit about Andy's preach. So his preach that he's going to be sharing in a minute is called Spectate, Commentate or Participate After Covid. Now that sounds like it's going to be a fantastic preach, a challenging preach as well, maybe. And he's asked if I can read Matthew 10 to us just to set the scene <clears throat> for it. Um, let's read that quickly before we do birthdays together. So I'm going to read Matthew 10 and it's verses 1 to 12. And it's entitled, Jesus sends out the 12 apostles. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Here are the names of the 12 apostles. 
first, Simon, also called Peter, then Andrew, Peter's brother, James, son of Zebedee, John, James's brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thad Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Don't take any money in your money belts. No gold, silver or even copper coins. Don't carry a traveller's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. Stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. Whenever you enter a city or village, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. When you enter the home, give it your blessing. Wonderful scripture there that Andy's going to share from a bit later. Now, let's do our birthdays for this week. <clears throat> Actually, before we do, I have a huge apology to make to somebody very, very, very special within our church. We forgot somebody's birthday last week. I haven't told you, have I? No. So we forgot wonderful Joshua's birthday. Joshua Pat's old. He was 13 years old and we didn't sing happy birthday to him. That's not Oopsie. good, is it? Oopsie. Should we say happy birthday to him together now? If he's watching, I'm sure he will be. Ready? Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Joshua. Joshua. We hope you had a wonderful, wonderful day. I think it was Thursday, just gone. 13. Wow. Don't we miss Joshua a lot? Love Joshua, don't you? Yeah. So we are going to make your mum and dad make you stand up now and you can join in the birthday blessing song this week. Do we think that's a good idea? Yes. Good. <clears throat> we have one more birthday as well this week and it's a lady from Zion Church Centre over in the Philippines and it's Cathy Riviera and your birthday this week is on the 13th. So have a wonderful day. Anybody else's birthday that we've not said that we perhaps don't know about? Happy birthday to you as well. May your day be blessed. May your year ahead be full of abundant blessings as well. So we're going to sing the birthday song to both of you now. And then we'll have Andy sharing the word. Bless you guys. Bye bye. bye. Hi, it's great to be with you um, once again. Um, yeah, great to be amongst friends and to, um, yeah, to share with you. But before we start, can I, just, can I just pray for us? Lord Jesus, I thank you for these guys. I thank you for this wonderful church family. I thank you for their deep and real and sincere love for you. And Lord, I pray that you will meet each and every person watching this talk today, whether they're part of the community of the River of Life Heartcliff, or whether they're just somebody randomly watching this, this video from elsewhere. Lord God, we pray that you will speak to people. You will touch hearts and change lives. And Lord, I pray that not only will you touch lives, touch hearts and change lives of the people listening to this, but I pray for that ripple effect that uh, as, as people are changed, that they in turn become catalysts for change right across this nation. Lord, we want to be used by you. We want to offer ourselves afresh to your service today. We want to say, Lord Jesus, 
work in us, work through us, and even work despite us. Come Holy Spirit and fill us, we pray. We surrender to you. We say, Lord Jesus, give us the word and we will go. Show us where to go and we will step out of the boat. Yeah, let us hear your voice and let us be obedient as we come and as we follow you. Help us to be people that seek first your kingdom in everything, all the time, as part of our everyday normal existence. And Lord, we long to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, in Hartcliffe as it is in heaven, in Bristol as it is in heaven, in Paul, in Eastbourne, in wherever it is we, we, we are based, as in, as in heaven. So come, Lord Jesus, as, yeah, wherever it is we, 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 have a, we have our heart, Lord God. It, yeah, Derby, Brighton, wherever it is that people are watching this from, Lord God. Yeah, Lord, we pray that this won't just be a few words spoken on a Sunday morning. Yeah, information to tickle our heads. But we pray your spirit will bring revelation to our hearts and transformation to our lives. That as we are transformed, so we will bring transformation to others, we pray. So come, Holy Spirit, we ask this in your mighty and beautiful and powerful name. Amen. Amen. It's great to be here. Um, and looking at... Um, Matthew chapter 10, I think we probably already had that read, but it's a great passage where Jesus is sending out um, his disciples to go. But interestingly, um, just before um, he sends them out, there's a very interesting passage. It says, um, just before the, the, uh, the start of uh, Matthew chapter 10, it says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, Ask the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into the harvest field. Many of you may remember, or, I, or were part of it, I hope some of you were part of it, um, when they had that significant uh, mission in Bristol with the turning um, for, with Pastor Yenka from the Gate Church in, in Reading. And um, he said this, he, changed, he slightly changed scripture, which you're not supposed to do, but I think we'll let him off on this occasion. He said, the fields are white to the harvest, and the workers are you. <laughs> it is few. There, there, are, there aren't many of us, but what God can do through you and me is amazing. The workers are few. So easy to say, actually, yeah, where are they all? But actually, it's me and you. So often I hear people say things like, oh, why doesn't God do something about hunger? Why doesn't God do something about injustice? Why doesn't God do something about... I don't know, church is being rubbish at evangelism. I don't know, why doesn't God do something about pastoral care? Why doesn't God, you know, why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't God do that? Or even sometimes, why doesn't the vicar do this? Or why doesn't the pastor do this? And I think God says, well, I did. I made you. I did. I made you. And actually, if you say that about the pastor as well, or the vicar, why doesn't the vicar, I don't know, visit people? Why doesn't the vicar do this or do that? The question might be, see, God saying, God or the vicar could say, what about you? about your call it's not you know very um i think right at the beginning of the bible um in the um we have the um call of call of moses and i think it's been the call that we've had we, we've often said to god god says go and he says better idea <laughs> send aaron have we ever done that <laughs> yeah god yeah here am i send somebody else <laughs> here am i send, send someone so who's more gifted here am i send my friend here am i <laughs> send my neighbor no send me I might be cracked, I might be broken, but who am I? Send me. I'm the only thing I've got. <laughs> I'm the only thing I can offer. <laughs> but I will, if you call God, I will go. That's what, that's what that passage is saying. You see, Jesus was talking to the crowd. There are lots of people listening to Jesus. You know, in fact, um, the whole um, a big chunk of Matthew is just, is just people listening to Jesus teach and heal, really. And the crowd is a big character, almost. In the gospel but i wonder what happens with the crowd you know what crowds often are people that they can be quite in a weird way a crowd can be anonymous you can sit back and you can spectate you can watch what's going on and i think probably lots of people thought oh i like what he says about this oh that's quite interesting blessed are the cheese graters if you've ever seen um, life of brian oh it's nice that cheese makers get something isn't it you know you have almost that step when you're in the crowd you're an observer you're a spectator but you're not joining in. You're watching what's going on, but actually 
you at a safe distance away. It's almost a bit like we almost, um, it was very similar to how life has been with both our life now and even more so with COVID, when we feel that little bit detached because we're watching it the other side of a screen. That's been how most of us have seen most of the world suffering, most of the stuff that's happening, it's come to our TV sets. And now where most of us are, are doing church via, via our laptops, via our phones, via our, via our computers. Again, it's everything's on a screen. It can feel more like we're watching church rather than being church. The danger is that we can continue after this COVID thing and think that spectating church is the same as being church. Very easy to watch church on YouTube and very easy to watch it passively to think, oh, nice sermon. Poor sermon. Oh, didn't like that choice of songs. It's very easy to kind of watch it with that sort of consumerist mentality. But church was never meant to be something that was consumed. The Christian life was meant to be lived. We were never meant to be an anonymous crowd watching what's going on. That's actually not going to save us. That's not going to do anything for us other than maybe give us some information. It's not the same as Revelation. I remember a sermon, um, well, actually, um, I think it was a guy called Richard Buse preached it, first of all. But he preached about the book of um, the book of Job, where Job asked the question, if someone should die, shall they live again? You know, it's, the, it's one of the big questions in Job. And Job answers that, actually. He says, um, I know that my Redeemer lives and I will stand with him on that day. But he, says, he also says this, if someone should die, shall they live again? If a man should die, shall they live again? And this guy which abused says it's a question we can answer hypothetically. Well, there's a good chance it's life after death. There's a, you can even answer it historically. There have been a few people who sort of claim to, claim to have a bit of a near-death experience, but only one person, Jesus, has actually properly risen from the dead. Well, I suppose you've got Lazarus and the widow's son at Nain as well. You know, so one or two people have risen from the dead. But, um, you know, it's not, you know, Jesus was the only one to do it <laughs> really completely properly, never to die again. So you can answer it hypothetically, historically, scientifically. You know, can you restart a heart? Mm, maybe for a little bit, whatever. But actually those questions are all, 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 all immaterial. The only way you can really answer it is personally. Will I live again? What am I putting my trust in? And many of you might have seen an assembly that um, we did on the Pace Trust. It's been on the web uh, a little while, where we told the story of Blondin. Um, it's quite a famous story. You've probably heard it before, where um, Blondin, the great tightrope walker, puts a tightrope right across Niagara Falls and um, walks along it very sort of gingerly, you know, wobbling as he did, you know, and if he fell, obviously it'd be certain death, walking on the tightrope like this, he walked all the way to the other, other side. And then he came back, pushing a wheelbarrow right across Niagara Falls. And then he said, do you believe I can walk across Niagara Falls, pushing a wheelbarrow with somebody sat in it? And everyone was like, yeah, of course you can. You're an amazing tightrope walker. You've done amazingly. Look at what you've just done. And he said, Okay then, <laughs> who's going to jump in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> and actually, there was a de deadly silence, a great hush. And in the end, his dad came out of the crowd and sat in the wheelbarrow. Today, I believe God is saying, don't be part of the crowd. <laughs> Come and sit in the wheelbarrow. Don't, don't just spectate. Christianity is not for spectating. Maybe you've been spectating for too long. Maybe you've been sat at the back and watching, going, oh, okay, I'm going to have a little... You'll look about this, mate. Yeah, God's saying the time for spectating is over. You need to make up your mind what you're going to do. The call of Jesus today is saying to you today, will you, put your name in there, will you come and follow me? Will you get in the wheelbarrow? Will you make the choice to say, I am in for Jesus. I am going to follow you. I'm not just going to watch I'm going to follow. Interestingly, Shane Claiborne, who I quote far too often, said this. We often talk about believers, though believing is a passive thing. It's about, you know, almost a, a, a kind of tick box thing about our doctrine. But actually, Jesus didn't call us to believe in him. 
even the devil believes in Jesus. What we're called to be is followers of Jesus. We're called not just to believe in him, but to follow him. The call to be not a spectator, not part of the crowd, but somebody who says yes to Jesus. Someone who hears the voice of, of God saying, whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? And so for those who say, who am I, Lord? Send me. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. Here I am. Send me. So not, not, not people who are spectators. We are called to be participators. And actually, even more so once lockdown is over. Because at the moment, some of us feel a bit like spectators. And God's saying, actually, spectating is not what we've called you to do. What can you do? God's call is to do something. Maybe you think, well, I don't want to just be a spectator. Show me, speak to me what I can do today in my context that is going to make a difference. Maybe it's just messaging somebody. Maybe it's just a short text message. Maybe it's writing a letter. Maybe it's contacting somebody. Maybe it's leaving some, something for somebody. Maybe it's collecting a prescription for someone. Maybe it's something. But let's not just be passive. For too long, the church in the UK has been passive. I've often said this, and it's a bit of a cheesy line, but I've, listened, I've seen so many churches that are very careful about their, um, what do you call it, their, their, their statement of faith on their webpage. But I want a church that has a, that's, whose faith makes a statement. <laughs> I think I mentioned last time about um, wanting, a, um, yeah, wanting to be a church that makes people, having a church that has faith, that makes people gulp rather than yawn. You know, a church might be sound, but if you sound asleep, you're not going to change the world. Let's not be spectators. Let's be participators. Let's be people who join in. Now let's look at this passage a bit more. Jesus is calling his disciples to go. He's calling his disciples to actually go and make a difference. Very similar to the passage also in Luke 9, where he sends out the 12, and Luke 10 when he sends out the 72 and he tells them to go and he tells them to to go with whatever they've got he, you know he says don't 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 take money don't take spare clothes don't take this don't take that you know because actually what i think he's saying is that he is enough you know what as a as a vicar person who used to do a or ex vicar person who used to do a lot of mission stuff i realize that sometimes we got a little bit we got a little bit waylaid with the prop sometimes we often think it's all about giving out the chocolate, giving out the Easter egg, giving out the this flyer, do, running this course, inviting them to that, that event. And so often we used to think, but so much about the things we invite them to, the props around it, that we forget that Jesus is enough. That actually it's not about all the stuff we put around it. It's about the message that changes lives. It's about a God who opens hearts. It's about a God who speaks to us. It's about a God who calls us to go and goes with us in partnership with us to, to win and turn this broken and upside down world the right way up through us working in partnership with him. That's the call of God to follow Jesus who empowers and equips us to go. You see, that's the call. So often we put so much stuff around it. So often we, so often we also, the other thing we do so often is we plan so much. You know, like, but do you ever remember that? Um, there's a Yes Prime Minister sketch where they, ha where they talked about this hospital that didn't actually have any patients. But it was an amazingly run hospital. It was a beautiful, beautiful piece of bureaucracy. But it wasn't healing patients. I worry so often the church is a little bit like that. It does so much. It's so smooth. It's so slick. But are we actually telling people about Jesus? Are we actually seeing lives transformed? Are we actually following him and leading and following where he's leading in obedience? Are we actually doing what he says? Are we actually following where he goes? Are we actually speaking words of truth into people's lives? Are we actually seeing the kingdom of God advance? Or are we just building a hospital without any patients. It's as silly as building a house on a load of sand. 
are we doing what he says? Interestingly, in, um, in the start of John's gospel, um, in, the, um, in the story where Jesus turns water into wine, his mum says to um, the, the, the servants, do whatever he tells you. That's not, a bad, that's not a bad adage for the Christian life. Do whatever Jesus tells you. He will lead and he'll cause us to follow. The question isn't, you know, is, is God, Jesus is always leading. The question is, are we following? Are we leading? Are we going where he's leading? Are we doing what he's saying? Because the thing is, if you're spectating, you can watch someone walk off. You can watch them walk. But are you following them? Are you going where they're going? Are we letting Jesus take the lead and following in his footsteps? In, the, um, in one of my favorite hymns is, um, Oh, Jesus, I have promised. And one of the lines in one of the verses is, is Oh, let me see your footprints and in them plant my own. My hope is to follow duly in thy faith alone. Following Jesus wherever he leads. Yeah, we, Jesus is enough. We don't need all the tricks. We don't need all the stuff. And so often we think it's about the stuff. We often do all this talking about it. And I sometimes think, I'm not against talking. I'm not against planning. I'm not against seeking God together. But I think sometimes what we do is instead we either, we either spectate or what we often do is we commentate. We're very critical about what other people do. But actually, I think as if we look at the end of John's gospel, you know, Peter says, well, what about John? When, 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 when Jesus sort of says that his, his demise might not be a great one. So, well, what about John? I said, well, that's his story. It's a theme that's very much picked up. In the, in the um, Narnia Chronicles, where, where Aslan often says, that's their story. You know, actually, too often we're very good at commentating on what other people do. We often criticise other people's ways of doing things, other people's styles. And sometimes it's almost a way of distracting from our own call to go ourselves. Let's not be somebody that's always chipping in with advice of what everyone else should be doing. Let's actually primarily focus on our walk with God and saying, am I being obedient in my walk? And yeah, I do want to hear what other people say. And yeah, I do want to influence and be a blessing and encourage other people. But, my, but actually to commentate is often to take our eyes off Jesus and to look around and to pass judgment on them. Actually, often we can, we can stop, we can hamper, we can hinder what God is doing by our thoughtless and our unhelpful words. I don't know what post-COVID looks like for you guys as a church, but I do believe God's got great plans. But I often believe that we can be so caught up in discussing these plans that we never actually get to do them. What we need to do is be people that hear the word of God and that be obediently step out and do it. The people of Israel were dreadful. They followed Moses. They followed the pillar of fire and the pillar of clouds. But, every, but they whinged the whole way there. That's not how the church should be. Sadly, it's how the church often is. And sadly, we see so many vicars, so many ministers that just end up being pulled down, being pulled out the game by sheep bite, by, by friendly fire, broken and hurt by the congregation they're meant to be pastoring, taking their own leaders out. It's tragic. We need to be a loving congregation that enables each of us to, be, to spur one another on, to make us better and more effective and more fruitful as we follow Jesus, to attune our ears rather than to be the brake van, if we were, if we were using a train analogy, holding one another back. No, instead we want to be pushing and spurring one another on to go forwards together. So a little challenge. Let's not be spectators. Let's think wisely and carefully about, about what kind of commentators we are. 
where we want to speak God's truth into situations where we want to encourage one another and not pull one another down. So often in a new season, it's very easy to give our own opinions. In a new season, it's very easy to, to state what we like and what we don't like and to, and to try and bring things back to what feels comfortable or what we'd prefer, rather than saying, God, in this new season, what do you want and, allow, and, and help us to be receptive and obedient in that. And we want to participate in what you are calling us to do in the work of the spirit, seeing heaven, the kingdom of heaven, birthed here on earth. So a little challenge as we come into land. What are we calling us to do? Are we going to go all out for Jesus, knowing that he is enough? Are we going to seek out those people of peace? Who are those people of peace if we look at this passage? They're the people who are receptive. They're the people who are around us. And maybe a good question to ask is, who is around us today? Who are the people that are interested? Who are the people that God has put in your path? Because we often think about going. And often we think about going in this sort of almost hypothetical sense, rather than realising that actually God has put real people around us who we have impacted, we have conversations with each day. The fields are, it says at the start of that passage, the fields are white to the harvest. And we often forget that maybe that person we chat to in the shop, maybe that person we've known for years that we, um, yeah, that we end up having a bit of a chat with on the way at the bus stop. Maybe that, you know, maybe that, you know, our, our, our family member who pops in and pops out sometimes who, who you've never quite accepted Jesus. You know, maybe, maybe they're someone we call to bless. Actually, there are people around us all the time. Maybe thinking, who are the people of peace? Who are the people who are interested? Who are the people that are wanting to hear more about Jesus? Who are the people who are, who are soft towards Jesus, who maybe might come to something if we invited them? Who are the people who, who God seems to be already at work? Maybe there's a prayer we can pray, God, help us to see what you're doing and join in. Help us to see where you're at work and give us the wisdom and the sensitivity to bless and nurture what you're doing rather than, um, yeah, yeah, rather than be oblivious to it. Let us participate in the kingdom building work you are doing with those around us. Because God is at work in, our, in and around us. Often I think the truth is we miss it. We miss it. God, show me what you're doing and help me to join in well. It's a great prayer to pray the people of peace. Too often we rush around trying to find this great magic bullet that's going to change everything. Interestingly, Jesus says, no, stay, stay in the place where you've got people of peace and work with them. But churches are shocking. They'll go, oh, let's run Alpha because that works well. Let's run, I don't know, this course because that works well. Let's do such and such because that works well in another place. We're always trying to find a new thing that's going to change everything rather than actually asking the question, who has God given us? Who are we already in relationship with? Who are soft towards the kingdom? Who are, who are we already in relationship with that we can bless and we can grow? What has God already given us? Who has God already given us? What's he already put in our hands? How can we hear and see and sense what God is doing? Yeah, rather than rush around trying to find some solution that's going to change everything. So a little challenge. Who are the people of peace? And you know what? This journey isn't going to be easy. Often it might mean giving up things we love. Often it might be costly. Often it might, you know, following Jesus might cause our feet to bleed and, and twist our ankles and scrape our knees. It is costly, but it is worth it. Jesus says, I'm sending you out like wolves, like sheep among wolves. Not wolves among sheep, that wouldn't be good, would it? You're sending us out like sh sheep amongst wolves. It's not easy. Too often I have this fear that we, we sell the gospel like it's a pleasure cruise. And people get on the, on the pleasure cruise and then they realise it's a warship. <laughs> Too often we forget to tell people that actually the Christian life is tough and hard. It's worth it and I wouldn't change it for the world. But it's not easy. It is costly. It is hard and difficult. But it is worth it. And lastly it says that God will give us, this passage talks about God giving us the words to say. Too often I think, well what can I say? And too often people are so full of their own ideas that sometimes when they get an opportunity, they say some really stupid things. I mean, I've heard lots of people sometimes, you know, not be very wise, but actually that, that place where we're saying, God, show me what to say, or maybe even show me, not, show me what not to say. Direct my tongue. Give me wisdom. Help me know when to start talking and when to stop. 
And maybe that's why God calls us to go out in twos. Because sometimes we need a spur to speak. And sometimes we need a wise friend to tell us to stop. Sometimes we need to go for it. And sometimes we need to pull back a little bit. Sometimes we need to speak up. And sometimes we need to pipe down. Going together. Iron sharpening iron. To go and do whatever God's called us to do. And maybe you might be thinking, well, I haven't got anyone to go with. Actually, my challenge for each one of us is look and see where God's at work. And think, who can I walk alongside? Who can I bless? Who can I help? Who can I encourage? And as we help bless and encourage one another, we realise that we're not walking alone. We're walking both with God and with the community he's given us. I just want to come into land with this, that God has great plans for you. That God wants to use you to participate, not to spectate. God does not want you just sat on a pew or sat on your settee or watching stuff on YouTube, feeding your head. He wants to use you to advance his kingdom, to change lives, to transform communities and to be salt and to be light, to be his ambassadors wherever he goes. He has given you people of peace all around you. There will be people. God is at work through you and around the people that you care about. Don't miss it by, by being too tied up in commentating what other people do. Don't miss it with trying to work out what else you could bring with you. Know that Jesus is enough. Know that it will be costly. It won't always be easy. It will be difficult. But keep on going. Keep on following Jesus, no matter what happens. No matter how tough it gets. And I'd just like to say... This new season, it might be a bit terrifying. It might be a bit scary. But I believe God has great things in store for you as a church and in store for this nation. God is not finished with me yet or you yet. God has great plans for all of us. This is not the end of the story. Indeed, as we come to a new season where, COVID is, where the COVID restrictions are lifted, this is a new opportunity, a new season where God has great things, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future, as it says in Jeremiah 29. God, God's rescue plan and transformation plan, the plan to see his kingdom come, is through you and through me, being obedient to him in all things, wherever he calls us, in everything. Amen.